What's up, guys? So, we're back again to talk about C.S. Lewis's book, The Four Loves. And what we're going to be talking about today is, as you can see from my lovely picture of the U.S. flag, end of a tree, is the love of country versus the love of nature. And the reason I kind of decided to address these two points was because, one, they're in the book, and two, I found them interesting, and three, I think they're just very prevalent to today, right? Especially when you used to talk about a country's past and kind of how you, you, you coordinate uh, an understanding of your country's past with a healthy sense of patriotism. And so, we're going to begin talking about love of country and love of nature by talking about why it is bad to elevate either one of these loves to an ultimate standing, to make it your number one priority in life or the very tip top of your value system, right? And here's a quote used repeatedly throughout the book that I think is an exceptional summary of why it is an unwise idea, you might say, to kind of place earthly things as your number one priority in life. When love is a god, love is a demon. Another way of saying this is, the second your love becomes a god, your love becomes a demon. Right? And the point of this is that when you elevate an earthly love up to a transcendent, transcendent status, then what you've done, in effect, is not only kind of twist and manipulate your original love in a way that's just not true, but you've also destroyed it in another way. Um, trying to take an earthly love and elevate it to a godly status is like trying to change silver to gold. It's alchemical. You're not going to be able to do it. Right? You're just going to mess everything up. It's important to remember this because it is easy to think of circumstances when, you know, a love of country has turned into a god and become a demon. I could point to, like, two or three holy wars by the Catholic Church as an example. Um, and just, like, ruthless colonization tactics that were used with the excuse of, you know, spreading Christianity or... Well, that's not a great example, but with the... Uh, the idea of spreading like the greatness of England or something. These are obvious instances of when the love of country becomes a demon. Now, uh, when the love of nature becomes a demon, it's a little bit a little bit harder to think immediately of examples, at least it was for me. But the reasoning here is that if you kind of worship nature in this way, then you're kind of worshipping the most base instincts of uh, human existence. C.S. Lewis calls it, very poetically, I think, the dark gods in the blood. When you worship nature, you worship these dark gods of the blood. You worship things like sheer power, lust, hunger, very animal instinct level of, of desire and of things. So, the first one that we're going to touch on a little bit more is the love of nature, right? So, nature is a, it's a primordial instinct, right? And something interesting that came from the book is that if you try to, if you try to look at, at nature and you try to pick out individual things from it that are beautiful, like an individual flower, or even the entire landscape, right? Then you're looking for the wrong thing. And you're inherently not enjoying nature the way that it's meant to be enjoyed, right? Because if you were to go out into a garden or to the Grand Canyon or to, you know, the Rocky Mountains and look at a beautiful landscape view, it might overwhelm you, but nine times out of 10, if you go there to be overwhelmed, then you will be let down. And in this way, since you've made love of nature a god, and that you're expecting it to give this thing to you, right? when you don't get that thing, you're going to be disappointed, maybe even betrayed, and your love of nature will dwindle 
for that reason. It will be destroyed because he made it a god, and thus it became a demon. Right? The way we should use nature is not as a teacher, but as more of a definer. Right? So, think about mm, glory. Right? As a feeling. You don't come to nature to pick up individual things in the landscape. Then you're missing the point. You come to nature to look at the whole, to just be in the moment, to feel it, to be washed over by kind of the mood and the spirit of the entire environment that you're in, right? So nature is not a teacher. Looking at nature is not going to teach us anything except, you know, trick you into thinking that animal instincts might be the best way to live life, or that those are the defining truths of life, that power, for example, is a defining truth of life. It's not. You shouldn't use nature as a teacher. You should use nature to give you kind of a definition, a feeling, a meaning for the, for the things and the words and the emotions that you're taught about in, in classes on things like theology and philosophy, right? So. If you looked at nature, nature, from looking at nature, you could never have learned that there is a God. You could have never reasoned your way out by observing nature and came to the conclusion that there is a God. But when you learned about God, and then you went into nature, and you were surrounded by its majesty, right, that gave you a meaning for the word majesty. In the same way that it might give you a meaning for the word, you know, hunger. Or if you stand on the edge of a cliff, and you look down then it will give you a meaning for the word fear. Your palms will be sweaty, your heart will race. It will show you the meaning of what you learn, but it will not teach you anything, right? It's very important to remember that. So a better way to think about nature is to think that if you went into a garden and you prayed or you meditated or you went in there and you did your, you know, daily prayers and meditation, and then you came out of the garden, you would never really be disappointed, right? You can sit in the moment of nature and just be at peace, because nature is showing you the meaning of peace as you, as you do something else, as you read or whatever. But if you, if you went into a garden with the expectation that nature as a god can, can overwhelm you or just strike you senseless with this beauty, then you're going to be disappointed nine times out of ten. So it's best practice to not treat the love of nature as a god. To remember that that nature can teach you, can can give you meaning, but it can't teach you anything. I want to be important. I want to be distinct and and precise in how I use those words. Right now, with the love of country, especially today, it's very popular to be like, you know, all nations do bad things. And for that re reason, all nations have a shady past. All nations have done questionable things at some point. And for that reason, any sense of patriotism can be immediately demonized by some people, right? And so that's a bad thing. That it always leads to bad things. But on the contrary, it's not always bad. There is a healthy level of patriotism that you can have, which will actually help prevent your nation from being sucked into things that it shouldn't be in. That will, that will cause you to kind of like pause a moment when someone's telling you that a war is being waged for wholly just reasons. And then there's also an unhealthy kind of love for your country where you assume the superiority of, of your country and you try to expand your circle of influence that is your country to more and more and more places, right? So distinctly, the components of the love of one's country are made up of about four things, C.S. Lewis says, right? The love of home, the love of a way of life, the love of the past, and a feeling of superiority. But this picture here, if you're wondering, is a, a windy road that, that goes through mountains. Um, the love of home reminded me of Virginia, where I'm from. So I drew that picture because it represents my love of home. So. To begin with, the love of home is pretty clear. The love of the place where you were born. The love of 
you know, the landscape and the family. And the way C.S. Lewis talks about it is you kind of have to train to be able to love anybody like they were your neighbor, right? So you start with kind of loving yourself, and then from there you kind of take a step forward and you love maybe your family, and from there you take another step forward and you might love your actual literal neighbor next door, your community, the people in your school or whatever. And then you keep kind of progressing forward in this way, expanding your spiritual capabilities, expanding your ability to love until you are able to love people who you've never met, who you're meeting for the first time, or whatever. In much the same way that, you know, when a girl is younger, she might play with dolls as practice for maybe, or play for when she's older and has actual kids. It's, it's uh, an imperfect analogy, but you get the idea. So the second thing is a love of the way of life. And this goes hand in hand with the love of home. Right, because depending on where your home is, that's going to impact your, your way of life. So, I lived, in, I lived in an international dorm for my first two years, and I know a lot of the people who, even if they just came from another state, but especially if they came from another country, they'd always talk about how they missed the food from home, right? And they couldn't find the right spices or whatever to, to make the food here taste like it should to them, right? Because that is a love of the way of life. And this is not too horrible, of a love, right? It doesn't get too demonized too quickly because it's pretty easy to understand that even though my favorite food might be grilled cheese and, and soup, if someone else's favorite food is, I don't know, ramen or some other dish, um, chicken curry, whatever, it's pretty easy for me to understand that that is valid, right? I'm not going to come in here and say, I mean, no, you can't like that. It'd be kind of odd, right? Now when we move into, now when we move down this kind of list, because each one progresses into the next, right? As you love your home, you begin to love the way of life associated with that. As you love the way of life, you begin to love the, the past of your country because you think that you love the way of life and you think that's the way it's always been. So you begin to love the past of your country. And this is when the love of country can really, in C.S. Lewis's opinion, become a negative thing, right? Because all countries do have a shady past. All countries have done bad things at some point. It's just a fact. And when you start teaching people that their country is good, that everything their country has done is good, right? That the entirety of a country's past is kind of mythologized, well, myths from the past are taken and presented as fact especially to impressionable children in school, then past and the love of country kind of become a god, and it, and, it, and it warps their mind. And in this way, kind of the love of the past of one's country leads into a feeling that, well, our country, because we've done things better, because our way of life is better, because our home is better, we must be better than other countries. So we must expand out. We must spread because we're better, we must take over things because we're better. We must, we have a burden, right? We're better than these other people. So we have a burden, the white man's burden is one example, to go somewhere and, and help these helpless people who obviously aren't capable enough to help themselves. That's where that idea comes from ultimately, right? That's where it stems from. Is Immediately it stems from the love of the past. That creates a feeling of superiority, which creates... A feeling that, at its best, you have to take care of these people, right, by invading them, which kind of logically falls apart on its face. Or that, worst case scenario, they're like dogs, they're like animals, and you have the right to do whatever you want to them, because you are better than them. Right? So this would all be examples of unhealthy love of country, right? And that can be bad, because when the love of country has become a demon, right, it's very clearly a bad thing. But why? Well, think about it. Really, in general, right, when you think about the evil things that a nation does, it's typically things that nations do to each other, right? So specifically, kind of patriotism can be bad, can be unhealthy, when it causes countries to do wicked acts to each other. Okay, 
Are you following? So, who does Wicked Acts, right? Because nations aren't exactly the ones that do it. Like, I don't decide if we invade the Middle East. That's not on me, right? So who decides? The rulers decide, right? So in general, nations aren't really wicked. It's rulers that are wicked when they act upon other nations. So, how do we... How, why does an unhealthy love of country help wicked rulers? Because it makes you, it makes you think that any war you go into is a holy war, right? Because you're on the side of God or, or whatever, right? It makes any war a holy war. And a holy war must be a war of annihilation. On the contrast, a healthy, a healthy love of country, where you can kind of look at the past and, and recognize that these stories are good, but they're still bad. They're stories. So this isn't history. You know, George Washington cutting down the cherry tree is kind of a myth. It's meant to convey a value more than it is literal fact. Right? When you can kind of understand that, then a healthy sense of patriotism can, can be a curb on wicked rulers. Because when a wicked ruler tells you that a war is just, you can kind of be like, well, I mean, no, I can, I can see that it's not. You know what I mean? I can just tell, I can know, I can at least have doubt about it. You know what I mean? I'd say that a lot of the, the rebuttal to the war in Vietnam would have been a healthy sense of patri patriotism. The sense that, well, you're setting capitalism up as this god, and communism up as the devil, and you're saying that for this reason, this war in Vietnam is an entirely just war. And people kind of, people with, uh, I don't want to say the people who win had, were, had an unhealthy sense, but, you know, a healthy sense of patriotism can make you see that, hey, you know, these two things might not be lining up. It might not be perfectly right for me to go. I don't, I don't believe that this is a just war inherently just because it's my country <laughs> that's going to war. In the same way that this isn't saying you can't go to war, right? But it's just saying, like, if a burglar broke into your home and you shot him, you wouldn't be like, that was righteous, that was godly. You'd be like, yeah, he was breaking into my home. The same way that, like, if your country went to war, you'd be like, yeah, this might not be, it, this isn't entirely just, because how could it be, right? But it's my country, right? And that can be a healthier sense of patriotism, which can, which can kind of curb wicked rulers more, right? So that is pretty much everything I had today. Thank you for watching. Um, check out the link in the description to join my school account if you're interested in more stuff like this. Have a good day.